Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome this evening to Queen's University's inaugural Equality and Diversity Lecture here in the Amelius Lecture Theatre. We're delighted to see such a good audience. Just a few uh, housekeeping rules before we begin. Firstly, this has been recorded and it will go out on YouTube right after the event, just so you're aware. Uh, secondly, if uh, anyone would like to tweet, please do so throughout the evening using the hashtag LoveQUB. We're not expecting any issues this evening, but if there are, please leave the doors down here or the two at the top of the lecture theatre. Finally, uh, I would highlight this is our last QPO lecture, our last lecture, public lecture of the year. There will be more events coming up in 2019. Please stay tuned to our social media accounts. This evening, we're delighted that the Pro Vice Chancellor of Internationalisation and Engagement is here to chair proceedings, and I'm now happy to hand over to him. Richard. Thanks very much indeed, Connor. I'd like to reinforce Connor, uh, Ryan, I think you were introducing the wrong person. Thank you, Ryan. I'd like to reinforce Ryan's welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure to see you all here. And it's really important for Queen's University to continue the public debates that we've been having. The public engagement series has been a fantastic series, getting major figures to come and discuss major issues here at Queen's University Belfast. Thank you to each and every one of you for making time to be with us. As part of the university's commitment, commitment to equality and diversity. We have, as Ryan said, set up this equality and diversity lecture to be an annual lecture and it's a real honour to have Conor McGinn MP deliver our inaugural lecture this evening here at Queen's. Conor has been Labour MP for St Helens North since 2015 grew up in County Armagh and after graduating from London Metropolitan University he worked in mental health, in public health and as the director of a charity working with prisoners and their families. Prior to entering politics, Conor McGinn ran a public affairs and communications firm specialising in policing, defence and security. He was political advisor to the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and then Defence between 2011 and 2015 and has served on the Labour Party's National Executive Committee. An alumnus of the US State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program, Connor has also served as an opposition whip and on the Defence Select Committee. He's currently a member of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, a member of the executive at the British American Parliamentary Group, and a delegate to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. He's been heavily involved in the Love Equality campaign to introduce same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland. He's the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Ireland and the Irish in Britain and a member of the British-Irish Parliamentary Assembly. Connor, it's a real honour and a privilege and a pleasure to have you with us tonight. And so to speak on the subject of rights, responsibilities and respect, building the common good. Rights, responsibilities and respect, building the common good. Please give a very warm Queen's University Belfast welcome to Conor again. Thank you uh, for that introduction, Richard. Firstly, um, it's always really nice to be home. Um, and it's a huge and very unexpected honour to be delivering Queen's University Belfast inaugural equality and diversity lecture. Thanks to you, uh, Richard, and to my good friend Ryan Feeney for inviting me to be here with you. Uh, my brother has a master's degree from this place and my father graduated from here as a mature student. Now they've always held it over me that I didn't go to university here. Uh, at least after tonight I suppose I can say to them that while I mightn't have studied at Queen's I have lectured uh, at it. Um, and in time honoured fashion for politicians I want to I suppose issue a few uh, preemptive caveats. The first one is that the title of my lecture might suggest some sort of conceptual or intellectual uh, treatise. Firstly, there are far more eminent people ensconced in this great place of learning who are much more qualified than me to examine all matter, uh, uh, matters in that respect. Uh, what I want to say to you tonight is actually about how these values and principles, rights, respect and responsibility are as relevant to our politics and society today as they ever have been, possibly more than they ever have been, and how it's the task of each and every one of us to believe in and build the common good. Secondly, when I was doing my A-levels, I worked part-time as a cleaner in the school I was attending, after school, along with my two best friends. 
the women we worked with, the mothers, the aunts, the sisters, and even the grandmothers of our school friends, took particular pride in the work. Uh, we as 16-year-old boys evidently didn't. Uh, in fact, we were labelled as dirt redistributors because we didn't so much get rid of it as just move it from one place uh, to another. The point is that one day it was announced in the staff room that a teacher had complained about his room not being cleaned properly by us three likely lads. And given the supervisor's predilection for telling us how useless we were, we expected a metaphorical or perhaps even literal knowing Jane McCann uh, battering. Except, unfortunately for the teacher, he happened to be an English man teaching in a Catholic school in South Armagh. So our boss responded in as diplomatic a way as you might have expected by saying, Sure, I know them three nuisances wouldn't wipe their own rear ends, but I'm not having some highfalutin boy coming over here from England to tell us how to scrub floors. So I want to make clear that I'm not over here from England to tell anybody how to clean floors or how to do anything else for that matter, because I'm, un I'm acutely aware that I'm in the unusual position of being a politician from here, but not for here. And tonight, I've been very lucky to have been given a platform to talk to you about things that happen here when I don't live here, I don't work here, and I don't stand for election here. Being an MP from Northern Ireland, but not a Northern Ireland MP, poses its own set of peculiarities and challenges, particularly when everyone from this place has a background or a perceived affiliation. And there's a determinism that expects that, therefore, they must think certain things because of that. I've always found when I say something that nationalists agree with, they say, well, fair play to him now, he hasn't forgotten where he's come from. And when I say something they disagree with, they say, shouldn't he be ashamed of himself given where he's from? And similarly with unionists, when I say something they agree with, they say, well, fair play to him now given where he's from. And when I say something that they disagree with, they say, well, so what would you expect given where he's from? So in my short but eventful political career, I've acquired the knack of annoying everyone, sometimes uh, separately on different occasions and sometimes simultaneously, a record that will undoubtedly continue after and perhaps as a result of this evening's remarks. The last time I was here at Queen's University was in April this year to mark the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. This year also marked another significant milestone, the 50th anniversary of the first civil rights march in Derry in October 1968. I was born at roughly the midway point between those seminal events that arguably more than any other have shaped the course of modern or at least recent history in Ireland and undoubtedly shaped the course of May and many other people's lives. But for me, these aren't just past events to be commemorated or analysed. They're as relevant today as they were powerful then, because the work isn't finished. The modest radicalism of civil rights in 1968, the ambitious pragmatism of the agreement in 1998, we shouldn't be memorialising them, but instead using them as our template, our constant study, our inspiration, our moral and intellectual compass to navigate these desperately uncertain waters of 2018. They have to be our springboard to overcome those who still seek to deny rights, block equality and hold back the tide of progress. And their legacy has got to be a route to building a further society, a better world, that common good and a true peace. As the recently canonized St. Oscar Romero said, peace is not the product of fear or the silence of cemeteries. Peace is the generous, tranquil contribution of all to the good of all. Peace is dynam dynamism and peace is generosity. So when I champion, defend and support the Good Friday Agreement, I do so not as one of its negotiators, its authors or its influencers, but as one of its beneficiaries. I'm a child of the Good Friday Agreement, not its parent. And you see, the fundamental mastery of the agreement was in reconciling competing concepts of identity, citizenship, and constitutional aspirations. It afforded rights to us all. It enshrined our responsibilities to each other, and it envisaged a respect that would emerge between peoples of different, and yes, still competing views. For me, as well as the three interdependent strands of the agreement, relationships, 
within Northern Ireland, links between both parts of the island of Ireland and between Britain and this island, there are also three very important specific aspects to it. The first one is the idea that it's people here in Northern Ireland who get to decide their own future. For unionists, the principle of consent, namely that Northern Ireland would remain part of the United Kingdom for as long as the majority of people here wish it to be the case, was hard won and long sought recognition of their status and legitimacy. For nationalists, that was tempered by an acknowledgement that any change to the constitutional status is a matter for the people of Ireland, the island of Ireland alone, without external impediment on the basis of consent given concurrently in both parts of the island. Nothing and this is very topical at the minute, nothing, no British government, no Irish government, no one political party, and no EU withdrawal agreement can change that. It can only be changed by the people of Ireland, North and South, exercising their right to choose their own destiny. Secondly, the agreement enshrined and respected the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to hold British and Irish citizenship and to identify as either or both. Now, many people are exclusively one or the other, and that is, of course, entirely legitimate. However, for others, including me, that simple, logical, but powerful proposition of duality took away forced and practiced self-exclusion. The idea that if you were one, you couldn't be the other two. And it meant that people no longer had to choose. And so it allowed me to say in my maiden speech, when, as an Ulsterman and an Irishman, I stood up in the House of Commons as a British MP representing an English constituency, that there's no longer any contradiction to being British and Irish and having feelings of loyalty and affinity to both countries. I stand by what I said and I still believe it, but that idea and the very agreement it stems from is under threat. Some people say the agreement has outlived its usefulness. That is completely wrong. The principles the substance, the aspirations and vision of the Good Friday Agreement were not the end, but the beginning. They gave us the basis on which to construct, construct a better future for people on the island of Ireland. The architects of the Good Friday Agreement gave us the plans and the foundations, but they left it to us, the people, to build the house together. Lots of work has been done, but a central tenet, the third in my triumvirate, is crucial to completing its construction, and that is the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland that was promised in the agreement. It was envisaged that it would be based on the principles of full respect for and equality of civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights and of freedom from discrimination. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission wrote the basis for it in 2008, 10 years ago. They said a bill should recognise that a just and equal society is best maintained by a stable and functioning democracy in the common observance of human rights, reiterate an absolute commitment to exclusively peaceful means of resolving differences, address the legacy of the past and the special needs of victims and survivors of the conflict, enshrine the entitlement of all to the full range of human rights and fundamental freedom safeguarded by the rule of law, strive to ensure that every child will grow up safe and secure, value the role of women in public and political life and their involvement in advancing peace and security, cherish our common humanity and advocate freedom from fear and want, seek to protect our common heritage and natural environment for future generations, accept the commitment to mutual respect and the religious and civil rights of everyone, welcome the rich variety of languages, beliefs and traditions which is the cultural wealth of our society, Uphold the existing rights and protections of individuals and groups, especially those that guarantee free and fair participation in economic, social and political life. Acknowledge the dignity and worth of every person and the equal and inalienable rights of all. Be dedicated to the achievement of reconciliation and the vindication of human rights at all. And if you look at some of those objectives and the progress we've made on them in the absence of a Bill of Rights, it doesn't make for pleasant reading. Recognising that a just and equal society is best maintained by a stable and functioning democracy. Devolved government here has been suspended for almost two years. 
No one you elected is able to decide, scrutinise or implement legislation that impacts on your daily lives. Civil servants have been managing departments undoubtedly to the best of their ability and with good intentions, but equally with no political direction or accountability. When we talk about addressing the legacy of the past and the special needs of victims and survivors of the conflict, we're focused on amnesties, statutes of limitation, definitions of victims. What about focusing on the individuals and their families and the communities affected? We are never going to agree about what happened in the past. But if you look at it solely through that prism, then frankly, you're condemned to live it all over again. Because for all of the various iterations of proposals to deal with the past, I have yet to see any real willingness to approach it with an eye to the future, rather than an eye for an eye. Victims deserve recognition, justice and peace. The Canadian theologian and humanitarian Jean Vanier said, peace is the fruit of love, a love that is also justice. But to grow in love requires work, hard work, and it can bring pain because it implies loss, loss of the certitudes, comforts and hurts that shelter and define us. We need to recognise the hurt and we need to try and heal it, but we can't be defined by it any longer. Another is to value the role of women in public and political life and their involvement in advancing peace and security. The two main parties here are both led by women, but only 30% of the Assembly is made up of women. This year, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women said that women in Northern Ireland faced systematic violations of rights through being compelled to either travel outside Northern Ireland uh, to procure a legal abortion, which places them in the most horrific situations. And then there's the welcoming of the rich variety of languages, beliefs and traditions, which is the cultural wealth of our society. Who has anything to fear from the recognition for the Irish language through legislating for an act in the Gaelic that would simply establish its legal position, ensure provision for those who speak it and encourage its developments amongst those who want to learn it? I'm not naive about the politicisation of these issues and the sensitivities around culture and identity here, but I can't help but think if there's a Welsh Language Act which has no consequence whatsoever for Wales's constitutional position in the United Kingdom, why would an Irish Language Act have any impact on Northern Ireland's status in that regard? Finally, to acknowledge the dignity and worth of every person and the equal rights of all. Now that brings me to equal marriage. I've said ad nauseum that strange as it might sound, it's not actually about people being gay or getting married. It's about people being equal. So I asked the Secretary of State yesterday in Westminster at the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee what message I should give from her to the LGBT community in Northern Ireland tonight. So she said to tell them that she supports equal marriage. That's great. I support Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> but I don't have the ability to pick the team. She does have the ability to change the law. So I have a message for the Secretary of State. Karen, we are fed up with the increasingly grating gestures, like flying the pride flag over Stormont House. And we want action to resolve the anomaly that still sees LGBT couples here treated as less than their counterparts in the rest of Ireland and the UK. We want marriage equality, and we want it now. Because I, I and the Love Equality campaign are not giving up. My bill is back before the Commons again this Friday, and it will keep coming back until the government supports its passage through Parliament or until they can come up with an alternative route to making it happen. The amendment that Stella Creasy and I forced on the government a few weeks ago, supported by colleagues across the House of Commons, means that the clock is now ticking on the government and that in a few weeks' time, they must report back to Parliament about the human rights implications of the continued denial of equal marriage. The issue isn't going away, and so I plead with the government 
at Westminster, stop the excuses, stop the prevaricating, stop the gestures, show some courage, and do the right thing. Because in my view, a Bill of Rights is not only promised by the agreement, it is the outworking of the agreement itself. It is a manifesto for a Northern Ireland where the common good is shared between equals, respecting each other and taking responsibility for shaping its future together. And legislating for a Bill of Rights, which the previous Labour government should have done, which this government should do now, and which Labour should commit to doing when next in government if it doesn't, isn't the whole solution either. The former Human Rights Commissioner Monica Williams said, if a Bill of Rights is to underpin peace, it needs to be embedded in attitudes and mindsets. It should not only influence the thinking and action of those in positions of power, but instill in each person a confidence in asserting and securing their own rights, as well as defending the rights of others. Or as President Mary McAleese put it when she said, whenever there is an absence of human rights, human potential is thrown away and wasted, and we have known generations of waste. Now that we face a future where we may at last see what happens when people once estranged work freely and comfortably together as equals and partners, a phenomenon still not given to many among our common human family, a right still not realised. Sadly, in 2018, we are a long way from meeting those noble aspirations and making them an embedded reality in our society. Because whether it's women, the LGBT community, Irish speakers, children living in poverty, survivors of institutional abuse, or victims of our troubled past, too many of our fellow citizens are denied the rights and respect to which they are entitled. And it's all of our responsibility to say enough. We demand change, we demand action, and we demand equality because this crisis of delayed and denied rights, a lack of respect and an abdication of responsibility by those who can bring about these changes, worryingly point to a much deeper malaise in our politics and our society. When we look at the great change that took place in the 1960s, it was a decade of volatility and unpredictability, but also of optimism, hope, and a belief that solidarity would bring about progress that social, economic and racial injustice could be defeated and that a better world could be built. It was, as John F. Kennedy said, the edge of a new frontier. But what of our world today? From Trump to Brexit, its volatility is marked by a regressive, hostile isolationism where plurality is being replaced with absolutism and vision clouded by a paucity of ideas and a lack of aspiration. Diversity is devalued and division is encouraged. We live in an age of othering, of blaming those not like us for, well, not being like us. He's gay, she's an immigrant, they're mixed race, they're in a mixed marriage. John Hume said the difference is of the essence of humanity. It should never be the source of hatred or conflict. The answer to difference is to respect it. Therein lies the most fundamental principle of peace, respect for diversity. I think about John Hume a lot. I am one of the UK Parliament's representatives at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Since 1948, its mission has been to uphold the shared values of human rights, democracy and the rule of law that are the common heritage of the peoples of Europe. It is the guardian of the European Convention on Human Rights. And one of the reasons I think about John so much is because the assembly meets in Strasbourg. The first time I went, I took the tram to the last stop on the French side of the river and walked 100 yards or so over the bridge from Strasbourg to Kiel, the German town on the other side. And John Hume did exactly the same thing the first time he went there to the European Parliament 40 years before. And when he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1998, he said, I stopped in the middle of the bridge and I meditated. There's Germany, there's France. If I'd stood on this bridge 30 years ago after the end of the Second World War when 25 million people lay dead across our continent for the second time this century, and if I had said, don't worry, in 30 years we will all be together in a new Europe, our conflicts and wars will be ended and we will be working together in our common interests, I would have been sent to a psychiatrist. 
But out of the horrors of the Second World War, people, politicians, citizens, leaders, did forge a new togetherness and cooperation. They showed courage, they showed generosity, they showed understanding. And that is our challenge again today. In the midst of turmoil, uncertainty, and all that we know to be bad in the world, our job is to be the good in the world, to be the visionaries, the optimists, the believers in better, and the architects of the future, to make our own great society, to build a new Jerusalem, where each contributes what they can and gets what they need in return, where we love one another and treat our neighbor as ourselves. Rights, respect, and responsibility, not just words, but actions. Building the common good, not just an idea, but work for all of us to do together. Thank you very much. Connor, thank you very much indeed for that wide-ranging and compelling and stimulating lecture. We now have the chance for there to be questions, discussion and debate. Connor has kindly said that he'll take questions. We have microphones at both sides of the room. So who'll start us off with the first question, please? Hi, Connor. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, I work at Queen's and my daughter's a graduate of Queen's. And one thing that concerns me is a lot of her classmates, including her, don't live here anymore. They've yeah. all moved on. So they aren't willing to wait until things catch up with what the kind of society they want. So that, I th don't know if that's a concern that the politicians take seriously, that they've just left. They aren't willing to sit around and wait. So that's something as parents we have to deal with. You know? So I don't know how you feel about that, or is there anything to think the politicians take that on board? Well, I mean, look, I, I, I moved away from home uh, to go to university, not for any other reason than a sense of adventure and an attraction to the big city. And I had a connection with London through family members that, uh, that lived there. But I've always kept a very strong connection with home. Um, and I'm very proud to be from here. And I try in an appropriate way to do to do what I can, uh, to do what I can for here. But you're right. I saw a, a program made recently and coverage in the press about young people moving away because of what they felt was the lack of a rights-based society and because of what they felt had been a regression in terms of onward uh, social progress and and the march of equality. Uh, but tonight in the foyer at the university here. There were 40 fantastic young people who are studying at Queen's who came to meet me in the Love Equality campaign to do a photo call and to demand that this place catches up with the rest of uh, Ireland and the UK. And you know, the funny thing is, of course, that the public support equal marriage, the public support steps being made in terms of uh, making uh, social progress um, I mean, you know, life is complicated. I, I didn't think when I moved away that I would be in England forever, and I certainly didn't think I would be a member of Parliament. But, you know, one year turns into the next, and then you meet a girl from South Wales, and you end up getting married and having two kids that go to school in St Helens, and that's just the way it happens. But I think also there is a, there is a hybrid existence that people can have now. You know, lots of people work in England during the week, they, or in Dublin or anywhere else, and they come back home to. And it's just trying to make sure that those people, although they're working away from home, when they're here, they buy into the communities that they're still part of. In, in some of the changes you were talking about, which have happened, say, in England where you live, but also it's true, I think, in the South, it's been quite recent. I mean, a dramatic change in terms of attitudes towards same-sex marriage, for mm -hmm. example. Can you say something about your impression of what it was that accelerated those changes in those societies? Look, undoubtedly, the diminishing uh, influence of conservative attitudes, many of which were perpetuated by uh, the political establishment, by the church and by uh, other actors. Um, secondly, though, I think people's lived in personal experience. You know, in my own constituency in 
St Helens, which is a traditional white working class community in the north of England, uh, after I made my speech on equal marriage in February, I was walking through Earlstown where we live, I was coming from the barbers and a man who sits three rows in front of me at Mass on a Sunday across the street and he said, I want to have a word with you and I thought, I'm getting both, both barrels here, you know, you can never be complacent about your majority even if it's a relatively, <laughs> a relatively healthy one. Um, but he crossed the road to shake my hand and say to me, your speech was fantastic, I really enjoyed it, my son's gay, you know, we've struggled being in a community that hasn't always lent itself. Um, being accepting of that, but he said he had noticed huge changes too, and I think that was it. Everybody knows somebody who, you know, is is gay themselves, or has a gay son or daughter or brother or sister or aunt. Um, and I suppose, you know, it has been a, a normalising, for want of a better term, um, of LGBT people, couples, lives, that has made that has made a huge difference there. And I think people. I think, you know, there's an inherent sense that people have now that everyone should be treated mm. equally, regardless of gender, race, sexual orientation, whatever else. Thank you. But I'm an optimist. Excellent. Uh, next, next question from the audience. Hello, Connor. Thank you for coming to Queen's tonight. We're very grateful. Um, I moved away from Northern Ireland as an 18-year-old. I couldn't wait to get out because I found the politics very insular, and I found there was an insularity here which I didn't like. And I moved back with my English wife and kids two years ago. So work in progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah away I just longer. thought I'd get that in. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I still find the political discourse here very insular in nature. And whilst politicians talk about different things nowadays, the environments or you know, that they're constrained by what I think is still this great insularity. It's kind of orange green or whatever, however you want to phrase it. What would be your advice as a, as a fellow country boy from Northern Ireland um, working in a, as an MP to try and elevate Northern Irish politics to be more kind of externally referenced? Get involved. What politics needs is not more commentators, it's more participants. You know, I hear a lot, uh, particularly when British media outlets come here to do Vox Pops, to stop people on the street in Belfast and say, well, why can't they just sort it out up at Stormont? And why can't they all... You know, you vote for them in the end. You know, there's a democratic mandate that all of the political parties have. Now, with a mandate comes a responsibility to act and deliver, not just on your manifesto commitments, but to keep the contract that you make with people about representing them well and doing a job for them. Um, but complaining about it isn't going to change it, you know. Uh, becoming active, whether in your community, uh, and not just, you know, necessarily joining a political party. I mean, my, my whole life and my ethos of community uh, came about through a lifelong involvement with the Gaelic Athletic Association. That idea that you give to others freely what was given to me freely as a child by volunteers who, you know, gave of their time to ensure that we uh, were able to have access to sport, you know, that we were part of a community, that we, um, that we got things that we otherwise wouldn't have. So whether it's being involved in your, your local church, your local sports club, um, your local community association, working with your local businesses, there are lots of ways that people get involved, but claim it. You know, don't wait to be asked. Claim it for yourself, the right to be heard, the right to be involved the right to be active, that's how, that's how you change things here. I don't think this idea, and I know there's been a lot of speculation about external actors and, uh, you know, catalysts from the outside coming and changes things necessarily. I think that's quite patronising to people here as well. I think the change has got to come directly and organically from, from people here. And you obviously believe it can. I mean, you, you describe yourself as an optimist. Some of us looking yeah. at the House of Commons over the last couple of years, let alone the yeah. issues around the executive, have seen things become increasingly polarised and somewhat, there's been a despair in some people. No, you don't already. have to work there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you maintain the optimism despite that? Yeah, you do, because I, I, look, it's a very febrile environment politically at the minute. Um, it's become very binary about us and them and right and wrong. And I, I still 
believe fundamentally that people who come into politics and public life do so for the right reasons. Um, and I look at you know conservative counterparts, MPs from other parties, uh, and I don't agree with them yeah. about how you do this, but I do fundamentally believe that they want to make the world a better place too. Um, we just fundamentally disagree about what you need to do to, to bring that about. Um, and look, I see the work that politicians from here do, by the way. Um, and I know it's not on vogue or the popular thing to say, uh, but they do work hard in terms of representing people here and in terms of uh, fighting the good fight to get this place um, recognition and assure of, uh, assure of whatever is being allocated to. You, you just don't often hear about that. A lot of the work is, a lot of the work is unseen yeah. as well. Thank you, Con. There's a question here on the right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Connor. Um, my name is Brigitte. I'm also a Labour Party member, but unfortunately we can't stand candidates in Northern Ireland. So it's really interesting to talk about political involvement, but it is a bit gruelling when you're trying and trying again. And also as a woman, of course, to do something and to bring change about in Northern Ireland. But my question is actually something else. Um, <clears throat> the, um, it is... It is very, very difficult to bring change, and especially at the moment in Northern Ireland, um, with the poverty and the universal credit coming in, uh, the rollout is nearly completed in the first phase. So it is very, very hard if you don't have money, if you have to go to a food bank, uh, if you're struggling to do, you know, to also have energy for politics. But I want to ask Connor now, uh, as a Labour Party member, um, what uh, what would you suggest we do here to fight universal credit? Thank you. Well, this week has seen the look. Firstly, this is a rights issue. Uh, you know what? The, some of the examples I quoted in terms of what the Human Rights Commission had said a bill of rights would look like talks about um, uh, you know the freedom from fear and want. I see in my own constituency a desperate need and a desperate want. Uh, I see the huge impact that universal credit uh, and the rollout of it has had on people. Um, and I told the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions that, you know, we're not making this up. You know, I would rather be talking about the really positive things that are happening in St Helens. But I can't when I have, you know, working parents, a mum and dad coming to me to say, like, we don't see each other. You know, our marriage is on the verge of breaking down because he works nights and I work days and we don't see the kids and it's a miserable existence. And despite the fact that we're working, we're setting an example to our children, we want to teach them about the value work, we still can't make ends meet. Um, I mean, look, the, the obvious and easiest solution, and of course you would expect me to say, is that we need to change the government. Um, yeah. But failing that, I think the appointment of a new uh, DWP secretary, uh, unfortunately, won't be the significant change that we all think it is. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, there are mitigations that can be put in place here by an executive in terms of welfare. So you need an executive back up and running too, and you need to stress that uh, on your politicians. But look, I'll certainly be opposing it at Westminster, and I think lots of my colleagues will. And there are a cohort of Tories mm. um, who, also, who also have real issues and real difficulties with this. Mm. Um, so look, unfortunately, they're in power and we are not. Thank you. There's a series of questions there at the back, so I'll take the one right at the back and then work down with the microphone. Thank you. Um, Northern Ireland uh, voted to stay in Europe, and that's the freely expressed wish of the people of Northern Ireland. It would appear that we're going to be forced out of Europe against our wishes. The only possible way I can see of, of that being changed is through a people's vote. Your leader seems, at the very best, lukewarm about a people's vote. And I suppose I'd be interested to know what your views are on the merits of a people's vote, or how does the people of Northern Ireland exercise their rights and their wishes to stay within Europe? Thank you. Well, I had no expectation that we would get through tonight without talking about uh, without talking about Brexit. I'm surprised we've got this far. How long anyway? We've 40, 40, 45 minutes. Um, we've done our best. Yeah. Brexit is bad. Brexit is very bad. 
uh, my constituency voted to leave. Unlike elections where you receive a representative mandate in the sense that people vote for me to make decisions on their behalf and if they don't like the decisions that, that I make on any range of issues from foreign policy to education to health, they get the chance not to vote for me at the next election. The difference with Brexit was it was an instructive mandate from the people to leave the European Union. Now the way I, uh, I dealt with that uh, politically and, and what I felt was an intellectually coherent way was to say well the only mechanism to do that is to trigger Article 50. So I voted to trigger Article 50. But I was very clear with people after that that it was back to normal service being resumed and that then I would do what I felt was both in my constituents' interest and in the national interest. I did not come into politics to do anything that would make people poorer. Not the people I represent, not my friends, not my family, not my neighbours. And I said during the budget debate in the House of Commons last week that I'm not going to do it. The choice that's being presented at the minute is between Theresa May's deal and no deal. That is not the choice. There are a range of options available. Uh, there is a parliamentary majority that will guard against no deal. I think this is a bad deal. Uh, I think it erodes workers' rights. I think it erodes environmental protections, um, consumer rights. I think it leaves great uncertainty for business in terms of a future customs arrangement. The Labour position is that we are for a permanent customs union. That would avoid the need for a backstop. But I do feel obliged to say uh, that although there are lots of reasons to vote against this deal in Parliament, and there are lots of reasons it's a bad deal, its provision in relation to Northern Ireland are not, mm. are not amongst those. I have always argued that whether you want to call it special status or recognising the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland, specific arrangements need to be put in place uh, to ensure there's no hard border on the island and to ensure uh, there's no border in the Irish Sea either. And there was a way and there is a way to do that, which is that we stay in the customs union permanently. From my perspective, I'd be happy to stay in the single market as well, but the party's position is that we want a single market deal too. In answer to your question about the people's vote, yes, I think I am in favour of a people's vote. I think I have come to the conclusion that the only way to resolve this is to go back to the people. I think I've also actually moved to a position where I could see a vote being put that had three options. One was one is a deal, the deal that the Prime Minister comes back with, one is no deal, and the third is remain. But I understand how frustrating it is for people here because Northern Ireland did vote to stay in the European Union. And the difference between here in Scotland and Wales, and I see colleagues in the Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru trying to exploit the fact that special arrangements need to be made for Northern Ireland to their own political ends. Um, in 1998, the Good Friday Agreement guaranteed that there would be no constitutional change in relation to Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom, unless a majority of people here decided otherwise. But what is leaving the European Union if not a massive constitutional change that people here have not freely given their consent to? So I think the government have made an absolute mess of the last two years of negotiations. And I'm afraid to say, I mean, I was travelling today, so I haven't been paying particularly close attention to what went on in the Commons this afternoon. But glancing at the withdrawal letter the Prime Minister came back from today, it's nothing that couldn't have been written two years ago. I mean, there is no guarantees, there is no certainty, there is no security, sort of warm, woolly platitudes, really. Um, but look, regardless of how good any deal is, it's still Brexit. It's still going to have an impact on here, and it's still going to mean that for my constituents, for people here, uh, for people across the whole of the UK, you become rule takers without having any say over what those rules are, and that's fundamentally not a good thing. Thank you. There was a question right in front of the last questioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Connor. I work at Christian Aid, and Christian Aid is supporting a bill that is currently going through the Irish Senate, the Irish Shannad, proposed by Senator Francis Black, to ban the import into Ireland of goods from the illegal Israeli settlements outside its borders. And I note that you are a member, or at least a supporter, of the Labour Friends of Israel. Does that mean that you will not be tabling similar legislation through the House of Commons? Well, thanks for that question, because I'm really glad to be able to clear this up. Uh, social media is not a good barometer of what people think, but there seems to be a cohort uh, of Twitter users, both uh, anonymous and identified, who every time I tweet about anything seem to uh, offer a very skewed view of what my position on these issues are. So let me say two things. Firstly, I believe in a two-state solution. I believe Israel has the right to exist. Uh, I also 
believe it should be safe and secure. I also support a viable Palestine. I support recognition of Palestinian statehood and recognition for Palestine. Uh, I oppose illegal settlements. I, I oppose the import of any goods from those illegal settlements. I don't support the boycott of Israel because I think critical engagement is very important. And there is a difference between acknowledging and supporting the right of Israel to exist and agreeing with the Israeli government. I think this Israeli government is abhorrent. I think what it does, I think its domestic policies are abhorrent, but I think what it does to Palestinians is outrageous and awful. Uh, and I have no truck with it whatsoever. But, you know, if this place teaches us anything, it's that certainly adopting, you know, binary views uh, and absolute positions and, you know, offering collective condemnation of a people uh, or a state doesn't get us anywhere. A, a Quaker philosopher from Edinburgh has a very good way of putting it, Alistair McIntosh, he says, when the centre collapses, the periphery becomes the centre. So I'm the vice chair of the all-party parliamentary group for CAFOD, uh, the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development, uh, who do a lot of work uh, in Israel and Palestine as well. Now, we had visitors who came to speak to us about what's happening in Gaza. It is absolutely appalling. The desperation, the destitution that those people are living in is completely unacceptable and needs to stop. Uh, and so I can't, I can't really say more than that other than it's complicated. Uh, you have to hope, you have to believe in hope that there can be a solution found. You can't give up on that, because if you give up on that, you're condemning the Palestinian people to never having a viable state. You're condemning them to still live under occupation, to still live in poverty, to still live in destitution. You're also condemning the Israeli people to always be afraid, you know, to never believe that they can be safe and secure in their own country. So, you know, I'm an optimist, I'm a realist, but you have to, you have to believe that a solution can be found but given the Trump administration's uh, unilateral actions in relation to things like moving the embassy to Jerusalem, um, I think the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause is, is in a very difficult and desperate place. Uh, it's, one, it's one that I support. I can't say any more than that. But I'm not going to in supporting Palestine and the Palestinians and their right to justice, their right to peace, their right to freedom. I'm not going to compromise on my view that Israelis have the right to all of those things as well. Thank you. There's a question there. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Connor, for, that, uh, for the lecture. And thanks for the, the call as well for uh, the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. It was 20 years on from the agreement, 10 years on from that, uh, the, the Commission's advice that you were quoting there. We, have, we don't have the agreement because of lack of support from the UK <laughs> government, lack of agreement among the local parties. Do you think now is the opportunity to actually bring a sharp focus back on the agreement or back on the Bill of Rights, the fact that we've been without devolved government for two years and maybe public confidence in that governance being at pretty low ebb given the, the series of scandals, is the time now to, to actually get that political agreement both in Westminster and among the local parties to put it in place as part of the new restored architecture of devolution? Thank you. Yeah, before, sorry, before I answer that, I should also have said I'm a parliamentary patron of Labour Friends of Israel. I'm also a parliamentary patron of Labour Friends of Palestine and the Middle East. Um, yeah, look, I think there... I, I, I think... Look at today's announcement on freedom of information requests, where uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service Public Records Office has basically said... Uh, that they can no longer respond to freedom of information requests because you don't have any ministers in place. I mean, that makes what is unaccountable governance at the minute even more opaque. It sets a hugely dangerous precedent. So we're approaching two years without devolved government. Nobody wants to see direct rule. I don't want to see direct rule. I was very pleased to see the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference uh, re-established. I think that's the forum where the two governments should come together. To try, and, uh, to try and move either a talks process forward, to try and make whatever decisions they can, to try and continue with those bits of the agreement that are working. Um, but I think the word you used, it, architecture, is a very appropriate one. Um, and I think that in any, you know, in any restoration of devolution, 
we have to deal with outstanding issues once and for all. Uh, you have to fulfil the promise of the agreement, which is about building a, building a rights-based society. I'm particularly concerned uh, that while all of the focus on Brexit at the minute is on the border, and actually quite a narrow focus on, which frustrates me sometimes, on you know, trade and business, uh, not on people and communities, um, and how they will be impacted uh, by it. There, there are also, you know, 40 years of acquired rights that people here have had in terms of being EU citizens, in terms of having all of those protections, in terms of the social progress that has been made. Uh, and there is a strong cohort of uh, right-wing conservative politicians who would want to use our exit from the European Union to dismantle all of that human rights architecture, all of those environmental protections, all of those workers' rights, um, and we can't allow them to do that. And that's why, actually, this, as I said at the outset, this is not some you know, conceptual discourse about whether a Bill of Rights you know, is a good thing or a bad thing. It was in the agreement. Mm -hmm. It was promised. It's required. It's becoming quite urgent, and the government needs to legislate for it now. They can't, you can't abrogate responsibility for people's rights onto frankly, an assembly that's there or an assembly that's not there. This is a job for the British government to do and it should do it. Thank you. It's a question at the back on the right. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, David Gavahan. Um, yesterday I was talking to a previous minister of Northern Ireland who, like myself, is an Irish Jew with a British passport. Uh, and I just would like to say I fully endorse your comments in relation to both Israel and Palestine. Um, you mentioned the subject being poorer. You didn't join politics for places to be poorer. In a report that's recently been published between IBEC and CBI doing business on a connected island, there is an alarming figure from my perspective, having grown up in the south, and that is average GDP per head in Northern Ireland is 27,800 euro, whilst in the Republic of Ireland today it is 57,400. Wow. The more interesting point is, though, if you extrapolate the growth rates in the two jurisdictions over the next 20 years, then you will find that probably incomes in Northern Ireland will be around 50,000 if we're very lucky, if we're very lucky. And in the Republic, they're likely to be 150,000. It seems to me, Connor, that as you stand up on the House on a regular basis, it is fundamental that people understand the rate of change. Mm -hmm. You quoted Mary McAleese. I've been in Dublin again today, as I am regularly, that we have the opportunity here in Northern Ireland to enjoy all of that. It's in front of us. Mm. We just need to change our minds as to how we direct ourselves. And it would be great to hear your voice bringing that to the House of Commons and Question Time and all the other forums, sure. because that is a voice that needs to be heard. Thank you, David. I endorse all of what you said. I would add the writer, though, that I'm St. Helens man in Parliament. They're the people who elect me, they're the people who rely on me, and they're the people who depend on me, and they're my first responsibility and concern. Um, again, you know, people elect politicians from here to represent them, uh, and they have a job to do to do that, uh, and how they choose to do that is their prerogative. Um, I don't wish to cause you any... No. particular pain, but you have another parliamentary colleague, yeah. and she may, has her voice heard all the time, and it's, it's not comfortable to hear her. Who's that? Kate Hoey. Oh, Kate. <laughs> Listen, do you know what the funny thing is? Me and Kate are, me and Kate are pals, you know? Um, I disagree with Kate on loads of things, uh, but I will defend her in that I think she was an important voice in the Labour Party. Uh, at a time when it wasn't easy to be an Ulster Unionist um, in the party. Uh, I think Kate has been in Parliament longer than I have, so I suppose feels more comfortable in being able to pursue issues not directly related to her, uh, to her constituency. Um, I would defend her right to say the things that she says, even though I fundamentally uh, disagree with them. But... Uh, I would also say that you know she cares deeply about about this place. Um, no, sure, sure, but I no totally, but I you know I'm not. 
you know, I, I sort of, I, I get the point. I get the point that you're making, but you know, I, I, my motivation for speaking up about matters in relation to Northern Ireland is because I care about this place. You know, the truth is, you know, you were saying you couldn't wait to get out of the place. I, I mean, it wasn't like that for me, you know. And I, you know, ho home is lots of places, and it has to be when you know I live in St Helens, I work in London, and I'm I'm from here. But you know, I. I I, I miss home, you know, I miss home every day, you know, I love this place, I love getting back, my best friends are still the lads that I went to school with, you know, I speak to my family two or three times a week, any opportunity that I can to get over, um, you know, I still read the New York Reporter and the Cross McLean Examiner and the hatches, matches and dispatches that there are there try and read the Irish news every day. I say to Dominic Fitzpatrick, every time the circulation figures come out that show that the Irish news is selling more and more newspapers, I say, as long as people keep playing Gaelic football and dying, in, in, in that order, in that order, you'll, uh, you'll, sell, you'll, sell, you'll sell newspapers. Um, so, I, you know, so, so, so I do try, um, I do try to do that. But, you know, I, I, I have to say robustly to nationalism, though, here, um, it made its choice about who it voted for, and I absolutely defend the legitimacy of Sinn Féin's position in terms of its abstentionism, because while I don't personally agree with it and I would like them to take their seats, in the end it's none of my business. They stand on a platform and quite clearly say that they aren't going to take their seats, and I suspect a significant number of people vote for them. Uh, entirely for that reason, for them not to do that. But you also have to accept that there are consequences to that, and the consequences to that are you don't have a northern Irish, a, a northern nationalist voice in in the House of Commons. And I am, and I am not prepared to be a proxy for that because I'm the MP for mm. St Helens. Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Go to Bryce there. Who had his hand up? Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much indeed for your talk, Connor. It was fantastic. Um, I wish you were my MP. Um, Who is your MP? Emma nope. Bengeli. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's by the by, um, and I do applaud your work on same-sex marriage. I just wanted to suggest that you might want to take, or would you want to take, a rather more nuanced approach to the Bill of Rights point that you've been making? Um, number one, on a careful reading of the Good Friday Agreement with respect, it does not say that there should be a bit of rights for Northern Ireland, okay. or that there will be a bit of rights for Northern Ireland. Yeah. It says that the Human Rights Commission should advise the government sure. on what scope there might be yeah. for adding to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a yeah. rather different thing. Yeah, but it did that in 2008, but I'm, not, I'm definitely not going yes. to get into a row on uh, no, no, an no. argument about the finities of human rights. No, with, no sure. With uh, you, but let's, let's, let's remember that the 2008 draft Bill of Rights says nothing. This is the Human Rights Commission's draft sure, Bill sure. of Rights, which was a, an estimable document in many respects. It doesn't refer to same-sex marriage. No. It doesn't refer to abortion law reform. Yeah. It doesn't refer to rights of victims of the troubles or of child abuse. Yeah. Just, just to take a few examples. No, sure, sure. So, so I, I'm very it doesn't, much in It doesn't refer to any specificities. In that sense. It doesn't refer to any specificities no, no, in that no. case. I'm extrapolating from... It doesn't refer to integrated education, would you no. believe? No right to integrated education. Yeah. I, if that's not a particular circumstance of Northern Ireland, which is what the Bill of Rights is meant to be all about under the Good Friday Agreement, I don't know what is. But I'm not here to criticise the, the draft. I'm here to make the more nuanced point that we might achieve more in protecting rights if we don't go the whole hog and say we must have this Bill of Rights, which is a very contentious idea to, to many unionists apart from anything else, but we must make progress on, on various, various individual mm. rights. Uh, such as the ones I've mentioned, such as other ones to do with mental health, etc. If we keep pushing this all singing, all dancing, I know that's a pejorative phrase, but if we do keep pushing that idea of a Bill of Rights, it's going to put us out of step with the, the rest of these islands. Now, the Republic, under the Good Friday Agreement, is meant to protect its rights, the rights there to the same extent as uh, the North does. And Fianna Fáil especially has said, you know, whatever is in the Bill of Rights, we will enact for the South of Ireland. I don't think so, if you look at it. No government in the Republic is going to enact what's in the, the draft Bill of Rights here just because of the power it gives to the judges vis-a-vis oh. uh, -vis the Oireachtas or the elected people. And if we have um, the kind of Bill of Rights that is being proposed, it would differentiate, uh, differentiate us more from GB. It would give people here more rights than, than in GB. Fair enough, you might say, but you can see from a unionist point of view, they would be saying, well... If it's, good enough, if it's good enough for Northern Ireland, why aren't people like you, Connor, arguing for a similar Bill of Rights in, the UK, in, in GB? And when 
when you did have an opportunity a few years ago to uh, put responses into the UK's Commission on a Bill of Rights, which the coalition government set up, people on the left, like yourself, and not you probably, but people on the left generally, didn't make positive proposals for a Bill of Rights for the UK because for political reasons they thought, let's not do that, it'll endanger the Human Rights Act. Uh. Which, which I thought was a crazy position to adopt. So I'm just kind of suggesting oh, you might I want to be more, listen, a bit more I nuanced. I totally get the point you're making. Um, and look, I'm a pragmatist, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, I, I come from a, 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 a Fabian tradition within socialism, which is about incrementalism. You know, there's that old line about the Fabian protest with the placards and the chants of what do we want, gradual change, when do we want it, in due course. So, you know, <laughs> so, so I, I get all of that, but I don't... But for me, I mean, you see, I would challenge the idea that rights are a nationalist thing. Um, they aren't. Rights are for everybody. No one should feel threatened by anyone else's rights. Uh, and as, um, as I quoted Monica Williams in saying that it's, all, it's about claiming the entitlement to your own rights, but also about defending the rights of others. You know, I understand that people have strongly held uh, beliefs that marriage uh, is between a man and a woman. Um, I respect that. I don't agree with it, but I respect it, and people have the freedom to hold that view. But what they don't have the freedom to do is in holding that view to deny other people their rights. Um, and I just don't think rights are something that can be uh, compromised away in that sense. You either believe in them, or you don't, you can't give some rights to some people some of the time. They have got to be for everybody. And that would be my challenge to unionism, which I have made privately uh, as well as publicly, uh, without getting into the constitutional politics of it. If you want the union, given demographic shifts and change, and there is no inevitability about any of that, by the way, but unionists won't ensure the sustainability and the survival of the union between here and Great Britain by shrinking their offer. Mm. Just in the way that nationalists won't bring about a united Ireland by reducing theirs. If you want to persuade people around to your perspective and your point of view, then you have to meet them where they're at. You have to make them an offer, and it has to be positive. If you reduce and reduce that, then you don't persuade anybody of your point of view. And unionism has a big challenge in that regard, I think. You can't argue against uh, sp specific arrangements for Northern Ireland in the context of Brexit, but argue for it in the context of people's rights. It's completely illogical and it lacks any credibility. Uh, by the same token, I think you're right. I think when we look south, there are limitations to what an Irish government would certainly do in that regard. When we look across to Great Britain, there are limitations to what a British government should do too. But you know, the unique circumstances of this place, the conflict that we came out of and came through, the nature of the structure of devolved government here uh, means that it is it is part of both in some respects, but completely aligned to neither. Now, that's not to say for a minute that I'm undermining the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, which sits within the UK for as long as the people here want it. But we have to accept the societal, political, cultural, economic, social reality that this place is part of both. And that is a good thing. And I go back to finish, uh, Richard, with what I said um, in my maiden speech, which I stand by. Um, you know, I feel Irish and I feel British too. You know, I'm married to a Welsh woman. My children will grow up in England. They'll be acutely aware of their Irishness, the Ulster identity that I have as well. You know, my worry about Brexit and where our febrile politics takes us is it forces people to make that choice again. And I don't want people to have to make a binary choice. I want people to be able to be what they want to be and feel comfortable saying what they are. Um, and I think the more generosity we can show in allowing people to do that, the better a chance we have of building 
the common good that I talked about in the speech and that I think would benefit everyone both in this place, across this island and throughout the UK and Ireland. Thank you. It's time to bring the proceedings formally to a close. Thank you to all of you for coming and making it such a brilliant discussion. Thank you to Ryan Feeney and the excellent public engagement team for the organisation and the logistics. As always, it's been a great success. We look forward to seeing all of you, please, at future Queen's public engagement events. When we set up the Equality and Diversity Lecture here at Queen's, the aim was to produce open, serious-minded dialogue on issues of high significance for this society, but globally as well. In Connor's lecture tonight, we've heard a compelling, passionate, eloquent, fair-minded, optimistic, and very wide-ranging engagement with these issues, and a brilliant fielding of questions. So in closing tonight, please join me in warmly thanking our speaker tonight, Connor McGinn.